LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Listen without limits. Unchain your brain. Change your thinking. Change your life. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is James Tunney, who joins us for the latest in an ongoing series of dialogues exposing the assault on humanity by the emerging global scientific dictatorship. What was once science fiction is rapidly becoming science fact. You will own nothing and be happy, immersed in a virtual reality of games, pornography and mindless distractions. You will be discouraged from reproducing, therefore you will not be replaced. The goal of a post-human planet envisages a much smaller population and in time, no real population at all. We are at a crossroads in the evolution of the human race. The future is taking shape in the present. You have asked, are we happy? Are we happy and effective? Consultation with leading experts in the field makes it perfectly clear, perfectly clear that we are all now programmed for perfect happiness. Perfect happiness. Perfect happiness. Perfect happiness. There are, of course, occasional technical or electronic errors in programming and or surveillance which produce perverse exceptions. First they start skipping prescribed drug dosages, then they begin touching, then indulging in various sexual acts, and the ultimate perversion, love. For such extreme psychobiological misfunction, only isolation will do. You know how a game serves us, nations are bankrupt, gone. None of that tribal warfare anymore. Even the corporate wars were a thing of the past. Now we have the majors and their executives. Transport, food, communication, housing, luxury, energy. A few of us making decisions on a global basis. Now everyone has all the comforts, you know that. No poverty, no sickness, no needs, and many luxuries which you enjoy, just as if you were in the executive class. Corporate society takes care of everything. But all it asks of anyone, or is ever asked of anyone ever, is not to interfere with management decisions. You still don't get it, do you, boys? There ain't no countries anymore. No more good guys. They're running the whole show. They own everything, the whole goddamn planet. They can do whatever they want. What's wrong with having it good for a change? And they're going to let us have it good if we just help them. They're going to leave us alone. Let us make some money. You can have a little taste of that good life, too. Now, I know you want it. Hell, everybody does. What's the threat? We all sell out every day. Might as well be on the winning team. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Hello and welcome, James. And thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. Great to talk to you again, Greg. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. James, today we're going to be having a discussion um, inspired by your new book, uh, Plantation of the Automatons, Rule of an Automaticity Loop. Now, that title in itself is quite a mouthful. Before we get into that, give listeners uh, who don't know just a little bit of a potted bio of yourself and then just say something about the book because we've spoken a number of times and I've been used to you doing quite short and punchy books and this one when it arrived i was quite surprised by because i mean you could uh it's it's a real doorstop of a book it's enormous yeah i want to yeah i wanted to check whether you could get it through your your, your mailbox your letterbox um yes i i come from my main professional background was in law i worked mainly as an academic and uh i left the academic world to concentrate on writing and painting and in particular in the last few years or, or my return if you like to to public contexts uh, was was directly associated with the advent of this new era, uh, which I is, is described as a Scientocracy. So I wrote a, a few books coming up to then, and uh, which had a sense of something imminent happening. 
And I've concentrated in the last few years on developing an argument and an analysis which seeks to explain to people what's happening. And that derives from my my legal studies and, and working with or in international organizations. And it, it requires a kind of a complex or comprehensive analysis to understand what's what's going on. So uh, I have described this period or this era as one of Scientocracy. I believe we have moved into Scientocracy. I dated it about January the 1st, 2020. So I believe we're, we're, we're living in an, a, a, what will be a totalitarian uh, global uh, tech uh, governance system. Uh, and the style of, of life in that context or the style of governance will be uh, what I described as tech bondage or, or uh, and using the motif, which is a strong motif for our, our would-be governors of domination and submission. And you can see that in recent, in recent uh, contexts or, or scandals. And uh, from there, I, I've, uh, I've described it as an empire of scientism, and I've elaborated to look ahead, and I describe the future environment we're facing, the nature of global governance as being a plantation of the automatons, uh, which, will, which describes a long historical tradition going back to the Romans, going back to the Greeks, going back to Babylon, Egypt, of the use of plantation as a central form of expansion of empires. And in particular, I focus on the development of the plantation system as it grew up in Europe, particularly with the British Empire, who are the masters of, of this technique. Uh, this, we could also point to the Spanish, Portuguese, uh, French as well. But this is a continuous, a continuous theme, a continuous strategy. So we're moving towards what I describe as a global plantation, uh, and that plantation will be governed automatically. So we're moving into a system of automatic global governance. And this, of its nature, will turn the human being into an automaton, and they will be governed by uh, by automatons or auto automata. Uh, and uh, so I think it's important to try and get some sense of what the objective is, because in a lot of the discussions, people are taking one little piece, and they believe that that's determinative and really we have to develop a comprehensive awareness of what the picture is and what the end game is. And once we do, things become a bit clearer. They contextualize what apparently disparate movements represent. So um, my what I've attempted to do is to explain, in some sense, where this technique of plantation uh, corresponds with and, and is related to now the growth of the communication technology network and how actually Underneath all this is an idea of the human as a plant, which is kind of difficult for people to get their heads around in some sense. But this is the central motif of governance in many sense. And underlying that is a deeper esoteric idea uh, going back to the evolution of humanity. Uh, we, we know about the link and, and Darwin, the, the idea of evolution to animals. But the older link is the idea that we evolved from plants. And to a certain extent, we know that our governors, our would-be governors, regard us as animals, uh, as well as that they regard us as a type of dysfunctional machine or computer that needs to be upgraded upgraded or, management, or managed. And below that, if we, if we want to see where the stage is, where we're going to with that, before that is, is a, a stage which you might associate it with, with the with with the what's what's the film Pulp Fiction I think the Gimp where we will be confined with our masks in small spaces I think there, this is a motif that comes through the the bondage context but ultimately we're going into a reverse a reverse idea where we become planted literally in the electronic network and we become embedded in the system so that we revert in in, in an evolutionary sense to something which is more plant like which is kind of like I know you discussed the green man before in your in your programs, but this is kind of a dark side of a green uh, of a green man, a green electronic man, and this is a deeper idea associated with a long history of plantation. And if you look at the the growth of colonialism, particularly with the Dutch and the the British, the significance or, or the Spanish, the significance of plants is critical. C Columbus is going for plants. The Dutch are going looking for spices. 
uh, the cotton trade defines uh, world trade for for a, 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 a millennia, millennium. So uh, people really should begin to look at the significance of plants and the idea uh, again that we're moving into a a an electronic plantation system. All the, all the language associated with with high technology with telecommunication is about plant. The green movement is creating a mechanical network. It's not about the environment, really. If you look at it, it's it's setting up a whole load of plants to sow the wind, if you like, and reap the whirlwind. So all this mechanical approach to renewable energy, the vast solar fields, is part of building a technosphere. It's not really concerned with reconstructing nature, as you could guess by watching the way the the green people uh, fly to all these conferences in their jets. It's hypocritical, and it's it, it's a different agenda. Well, maybe br- just briefly say uh, for background for people a word about the idea of plantation. Historically, it was something that's very familiar to me, but it may not be to many listeners. For example, I grew up learning in history about the plantation of Ulster. Uh, you know, where I'm from, that was a thing. And one of my friends growing up lived, he grew up on Plantation Road in the town yes. <laughs> right where I'm from. So, yeah. you know, this, this, just just to sort of fill in for people who you, you've been very lucid in what you've said, but just historically, it, what that actually involved. Yeah. Well, really, it began, it goes back to the Portuguese in its modern form. And as they began to uh, explore the coast of Africa and discover places like Madeira, and develop um, sugar plantations, and so going back to King Henry the Navigator, uh, there was an idea that you could use groups of people to achieve particular purposes, like grow sugar, for example, in a particular area. Uh, and then it expanded with the Spanish going to in the various modes that the Spanish used in South America in relation to how they would utilize the the, the native population, exploit them to for, for mining and for crops. Um, and in its mo- in its modern form, it was developed in particular from Tudor times, and it was developed uh, in Ireland, uh, as you, you know. And uh, in particular, uh, movements there was a variety of movements of plantation. And it's important to emphasise that in this context, the historical idea of plantation is really about planting people. So, if you look at the plantation of Ulster, actually a lot of the old forest was cleared in order to and associate with that as a shift to agriculture and often to single crops like uh, flax, for example. So the, the plantation notion has the idea of planting people and then it usually associated with displacing a native population and, and obviously the, the native Irish in the context of, of Ulster uh, and displacing a native population and then shifting to a particular crop that, is, that can be sold or used in a metropolitan context or, or to larger markets. So uh, firstly, it's an effort, to, it's, it's a method of uh, securing land. I mean, that's what the Romans used it to reward the soldiers, for example, in the imperial army. Uh, so you, you secure the land, you form a base, and then you build up the, an economic system that's integrated into the empire. So uh, in, in the United States, there's a lot of recent work about about plantations and they define it by its um they define it in the particular african-american context which was a a particularly horrible uh, example uh in the triangle of trade but it's an older tradition and the the racial argument it doesn't work in the same way in some sense if you look at the irish context unless you want to say that the the irish were a different race from the people that were planted but that's not really a strong argument so really uh, we, we must see it in the total context and, and accept that the particular examples with very particular manifestations, say in the African-American context. Now, you used the word scientocracy. Uh, I've not seen that anywhere else. I don't know if you've actually coined that term, but technocracy is something that people have been hearing, hearing a great deal about during the last two or three years. You know, the works, uh, publications of transnational bodies such as a you know non-governmental body such as the uh, world economic forum and uh, scientism is something that people will be familiar with as well that again has kind of drifted somewhat more into the public consciousness during recent times 
So what we have lived through with uh, the pandemic, whatever you think about its origins or nature or the response to it, has brought many of these issues to the fore in terms of both government and again, you know, transnational global organizations that their, their their statements, their actions, their proposals, but also in in people's thinking about the future and uh, the, the the situations that we face, threats, real or otherwise. But I'm reminded of this is actually nothing new for yourself, probably myself and, and others, if not the mass of the population, these concepts, these ways of thinking, uh, proposals, uh, ideas about the future of our civilization extend back a long way. Uh, and this is something that you've documented in your writings. So it's really something that for many people appears to be new. Uh, where did this come from? Uh, again, in recent times. But this, that historically, this is a long, long history. Yeah. And perhaps uh, it's worth just to refer to what, what some of those terms mean, uh, as you've suggested. Uh, Scientocracy is C.S. Lewis. That was the word that he used to describe the greatest totalitarian threat, and he was ahead of the game on that. Now, I believe that C.S. Lewis and Tolkien probably had access to more information than they let on. They they, they probably listened more uh, than they let on in relation to what was happening. And we can see that in the dialogue between C.S. Lewis and Arthur C. Clarke. And Arthur C. Clarke represents this technocratic totalitarian uh, disposition uh, in many senses, that kind of imperial science uh, management. So C.S. Lewis really warned about scientocracy, and he warned associated with that there would be uh, an abolition of, of, of man, of humankind. So he was the one that really uh, identified that issue. And, and, and when I had come to that conclusion and looked back, looked back through the literature, he was the one that most anticipated this idea of scientocracy. So I believe that we're in scientocracy now, that we've happened, that now you're going to you open the paper and, and you're reading about lateral, well, if you read the paper, I don't, but people will be reading about lateral flows, they're getting used to this idea, masks. He said that the worst totalitarianism would be based on science, that it was inherent in the scientific method, and that it would combine the worst of fascism and communism and and he anticipated it as being the, the worst form of totalitarianism, as far as I can see. So that's a wider notion, uh, and he the wider notion of technocracy. Technocracy uh, has has come to mean something uh, general in that sense, but actually it has a spe- specific meaning going back to the thirties. And this this is it, it is actually important to understand what's happening, and it, it defines or explains what the context of this interest in electricity is. The idea was that you could replace the existing forms of economy with a system of control which was based on your use of electricity. And this is what all this object, this is what all these issues about pipelines, energy, the energy companies gone bust. It's a shift to a new uh, economy. It's going to disappear. It's going to make the economy disappear. And it's going to your life is going to be uh, managed, interpreted by your use of electricity. It sounds daft, but that's what they've been working on uh, for 90 years. Associated with that, uh, there's a book out this month. I don't know if it's published yet about capitalism and how it's uh, evolved. And it makes the case that in 1920s, there was a new shift towards economics as a new discipline. And this uh, this idea of economics as a kind of scientific discipline was born in a technocratic way to justify uh, bouts of austerity, which would which would deflate the workers' movement that they were worried about at that time. So uh, there's a wider technocratic uh, notion, but but so that's a very specific, the central idea uh, of technocracy in many sense is that idea of a shift to a total system of control based on electricity. And that's what's happening. That's what will be happening next year. And that's why you'll see companies going bust. You'll see businesses going out. And then you'll have this idea that is really for managing the and protecting the environment that will stop you moving and will you'll have to justify your existence, what you do, uh, limitations, etc. But... These are all the products, these are all the poisoned fruit of a long system 
or effort from uh, Imperial Europe in particular uh, to utilize science to manage by a scientific elite. So the, the main leader in that context is, is Francis Bacon. And Francis Bacon was very associated with plantation. And he was very associated with the, the book, the unfinished book, New Atlantis, with the idea of um, the idea of having a scientific elite in secret managing the world through their collection of intelligence, uh, which is, of course, information about people, data, and the use of high technology to uh, control uh, systems. And from that idea uh, and the Royal Society, we have an idea of imperial science, a utilitarian idea, an idea of using uh, the, the or, or marrying science with the empire's needs. Now, I argue in my Empire of Scientism book that what has happened is that, uh, as people like J.D. Barnall have told us, that they would, he wrote in the 1920s, and uh, similar to H.G. Wells, he described a world in the future where scientific corporations would take over by stealth, and they would then turn people uh, effectively into mechanical beings, and uh, the elite would escape to the uh, to, to space, and they would use the earth as an experimental zoo, basically, for people that didn't want to change. So, yeah, had, th there's the basis of really all the ideas about the Matrix, etc., and Haldane, other people are associated with that. So that goes back to the long tradition, basically, of imperialism. So what we're talking about is a perfection of imperialism, an extension to a global scale, and that's really what globalism is about, not just global, not just the forces of globalization, but the, the idea of governing on a global scale. And this was anticipated by Churchill in his idea of shifting to the empire of the mind. He outlined the idea that we had to, we, there was a choice between anarchy and order. He, he outlined this in his speech in Harvard, and he, he suggested that the empire of the mind was the future. And this was something which was in particular born out of the work in places like Bletchley Park, the work of Alan Turing and that in cybernetics, where they realized that they could utilize this technology, building on the systems they had laid down around the world from the 1850s onwards, from the sea cables, uh, which, which, which mirror the sea routes that the British Empire had controlled after the, the Seven Years' War. And they laid down the, the undersea cables along the sea routes and they developed most of the major technological developments uh, came from places like Britain and America, the Anglosphere. The Anglosphere extended or the, the, the imperial axis extended to Japan once they had come to California and established bases in California, a place like Berkeley. And then they were able to, to use that as a base to begin to exert control over, over Japan. So I, I focus on the Atlanticist basis of uh, the move towards global government. And in particular, around that time, you had the birth of NATO. Around the, And NATO, if you look at the literature, the book, one of the books that inspired NATO called Union Now, I think in 1939, he explicitly says, uh, Clarence Strait in, in, in that book explicitly says that uh, the machine requires a world government so world government was a function of the machine the machine was not a function of world governments quite incredible uh, this, the description so nato and the atlanticist system is predicated on the idea of mechanization and of building a machine and a machine the machine ultimately is a machine of governance and it becomes then the the technosphere and that's quite clear from from looking through the literature do you recall the, there was three of them, I, I, if I recall correctly, the, the Zeitgeist movies from a decade or more ago? Did you watch those? Uh, no, I don't. I, I don't have a television. I don't go to the cinema anymore. So I'm relying on, uh, I, 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 I look at certain things when I'm following themes. So uh, I, I'm not a culture vulture like you are, you are Greg. Okay. So Zeitgeist was a series of movies, I say a trilogy that was brought out a decade or more ago, and very much, when you look back particularly, advocating technocracy as the answer to all our problems, a resource-based economy, essentially, yeah. you know, decrying the current state of the world and the economic, social, political, 
uh, and other systems that were, you know, seen as uh, portrayed as falling apart. And this was the answer, you know, don't worry about money, work with what we actually have, which is resources, which is true. That's all we have. Uh, you know, sometimes when they say things like, oh, well, in this African village, we can't, they can't afford to build a school all the while the building materials are sitting around them, but they yeah. don't have, they don't have pieces of paper or numbers on a screen that say they can build it. So that that is the case. But in any event, if any listeners have not seen those movies, I would urge them, and they're skeptical about the direction of travel that we're currently on. Yeah, look at that again because they were quite the they were called zeitgeist for a reason. You know, they were quite the 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 subcultural phenomenon at the time, with a lot of people saying this is what we need to do. You know. Yeah, there, there's a. Uh, you've been very good in your series on ontology about picking up the clues that were there, and sometimes it's people signalling what's happening. Sometimes it's a priming uh, for us of what's going to happen. You remember those? There's plenty of, of of examples I can think of which which predicted or, or anticipated or described to us what was going to happen if you look hard if you look hard enough, and you have. Um, and like the ideas, for example, of the circular economy are becoming very strong. Uh, and uh, there's particular manifestations of particular ideas which sound good. But when you look at where they come from, you see that they they fit very well into cybernetics, which which, of course, is really about governance of people by technology, really how, how to govern human behavior. And I know that that's critical because if you look in in the mindset of the ones that would be governors. If you look, for example, at China and the incredible, uh, incredibly horrible uh, confinement of its citizens uh, in, in, in ongoing supposed COVID problems, which the West doesn't seem to be bothered about. It doesn't seem to be bothered about because it's a forerunner of what we're going to get. Uh, and it's people have, have given up on that, uh, have got used to giving away their liberty. But this idea of locking in an entire population, tens of thousands of people, they're calling a closed loop system. And so it's its using the language of management uh, of information, cybernetics. And another example from the West, Elon Musk, he's using the language, uh, for example, of amplification. Uh, this is, again, another cybernetic concept. So both both the West and uh, the East, uh, communism and capitalism, is speaking in the language of this cybernetics, of technocracy, of the management by information and uh, and control. And we can see how they've used these systems uh, and they're using these systems all around the world from Canada to the Middle East so that they, you know, they can cut off your bank account through this, this, this push button uh, power. So the... Uh, the ideas were there. We have to get we have to get uh, more focused on the specificity of what they're doing and their mindset. Because if you look at people behind the logic of the uh, Club of Rome, for example, like Donella Meadows, who's an expert in cybernetics, she said that it doesn't matter what system you get to govern a world. But you have to remember, or you have to focus when you're analysing any complex problem about what the ultimate aim of of the system is. And that's not that's what people are not focusing on. So all these debates that are going on every day, you know, whether from transgenderism to whatever the environment, uh, they don't focus on the big issue. The big issue is this movement towards total automatic governance. Everything else is subsumed and designed or anticipated to ultimately go towards uh, towards that goal. And the last point this idea of green uh, as well it can be interpreted in another way uh, the green movement uh, doesn't doesn't seem to be that interested in nature anymore it's more interested in a technical solution and part of this uh, well to make another cultural reference in Sim i think it was simpsons the movie where the the dome was built over springfield this is a, this is an idea as you know that's very well established in the scientific uh, in science fiction uh, and the idea of an enclosure of human space. This this idea goes back to the management of plants, to greenhouses, to glass houses. And there's a kind of a psychopathic suggestion in it that that uh, in this idea of the humans as plants, we're moving towards this green environment whereby 
the uh, the technosphere forces us into con- concentrated spaces which are covered in glass uh, as in an acclimatized sense as they possibly destroy the atmosphere in the desire to uh, to ransack the, the natural resources of the world to build this supposedly environmentally friend- friendly uh, system well yeah you talk about the sort of contradictory m- sort of motivations of the so-called green movement uh, there's, there's a school of thought that the technocracy and, uh, you know, that the, this impulse is a response to what at root is a mounting, a gathering energy supply problem. And that our industrial civilization of the type that you and I live in isn't sustainable. It's going into decline and that has to be managed better to manage that in an orderly, if very controlled way than to allow it just, you know, an, an anarchic collapse but at the same time you then have a lot of so-called solutions proposals and technocratic ideas that appear to be entirely dependent on increasing amounts of energy you know the the command and control and surveillance grid then that matrix is very energy dependent so that those in themselves are kind of contradictory i i think the answer to this question for me goes back to what Deng Xiaoping said in 1992. And he said, the Chinese leader at the time, and the head of the Communist Party, he said that the Middle East has oil, but we don't have to worry because we have rare earths. Now that refers to the the 17 metals that are used for particular purposes. um, uh, And that China uh, has the biggest industry in, in the world at the moment. Now, these rare earths are critical for all of this technosphere. So for all your electric vehicles, all your windmills, uh, all your, your, your televisions, your screens, the rare earths are there. And uh, in particular, they ha- China is rich in, in, in things like uh, graphite, which is critical in, 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 the, in the future management of the world. So when we're shifting to electrical vehicles and all that, uh, as well as the destruction of places uh, like New Caledonia, where the, when they're getting the digging up the the earth to get access to the necessary minerals to operate the batteries, uh, and China is devastating uh, uh, its environment. It still gives them strategic control over the basis of the new infrastructure, the new environmental infrastructure. So instead of being dependent on the Middle East, we become dependent uh, on China. So there's a shift of focus from the pow- of power uh, from the Middle East uh, to China, uh, in my view. I don't think the rare earths, although they, they're found all around the world, the full range of them gives China a lot of power. And any system like a digital currency increases the demand for these uh, rare earths. So that's probably the basis on which Deng Xiaoping was so confident about the uh, the future relevance of China. So if you ask, well, what's the renewable resource and what's the non-renewable resource? There's a lot of people that don't agree with the idea that we have got to the end of, of, of oil, for example. And you say, well, renewable energy. You're talking about all these vast windmills that are putting up in beautiful places in Ireland. Uh, I saw one a piece there recently about them putting up a windmill in a beautiful Christian s- spot uh, in Cork. Uh, there's a there's a strange there's a strange process associated with this proliferation of, of these machines that are very hard to dispose of. The machines are not renewable. Um, they re- talk they talk about the air or, or the wind as, uh, as being re- renewable, but they're they're setting up vast fields that will interfere with nature you know for people that supposedly love nature they're going to kill loads of birds they're going to interfere with migratory uh, patterns they're going to ruin the uh, the cultural ethos the link uh, with the past and all the, at, at the base of that is still the equivalent of oil which will be the rare earths necessary to make these things work so in all this china gets more powerful uh, and the West gets more more dependent on this uh, technosphere, on this plantation of 
of uh, metallic uh, and costly, uh, costly resources. Uh, so it's, it's a bit of a myth. That concludes part one of our interview. Part two will be available soon in the subscribers area at legalizefreedom.com. Legalizefreedom.com.